All right. Now, what I'm going to be preaching on tonight, I actually, I enjoy these sermons. These are some of my favorite sermons to preach. Occasionally, I'll, I'll preach about a particular character in the Bible. I've preached on Daniel before. I've preached on um, the Apostle Peter. I've preached on the life of, of King David. I've preached on many different people in the Bible. And it's a good way to you know, really kind of understand a character and a person. And there's so many great heroes of the Bible and people that we could set up and look to as a good example of, of somebody to follow. And King Josiah is one of those good examples. And um, like I said, this is one of my favorite types of sermons. We're going to be learning all about King Josiah tonight. Now, just to put this all in, in reference here, you know, as we're reading the book of basically First and Second Samuel, you're going to find goes through just like um, King Saul in all of 1 Samuel, and then King David, and his sons, and that's in like 1 and 2 Samuel, kind of take up those whole books. But then the book of 1 and 2 Kings are all of the kings that came after David and his sons. So that's really where things start to pick up, and that's when the, the kingdom of Israel, the whole kingdom, divided into two kingdoms. There's the kingdom of Judah and the kingdom of Israel. And as you read through these chapters in 1 and 2 Kings and in 1 and 2 Chronicles, you're going to see kings of Judah and kings of Israel. Kings of Judah, kings of Israel, all throughout the Bible now, um, or all throughout these chapters, because they each had kings. So if you're not really familiar and you haven't read the Bible a whole lot, it can be a little bit confusing. It just kind of, you're not really placing all of these kings. But they're definitely um, taking place you know, it goes through and it usually gives you kind of simultaneously, okay, here's this king reigns and then this other king reigns and they reign for different time spans and everything else. So all that being said, Josiah is real close to the end of the kingdom of Israel even being a nation at all. We're really the kingdom of Judah. This is right before the Babylonians come in and take over and take the children of Israel captive and bring them away into, into Chaldea, into, into another land. So what had happened previously is that there was a king called Manasseh prior to Josiah, and he had done all kinds of wickedness and all kinds of evil. He had caused his, his children to pass through the fire unto Molech. And that's what, see, what had happened is the children of Israel at this time had gotten way far away from serving the Lord and started serving other false gods, just other heathen gods, you know, idols. And one of the practices that they did, and it's, and it's bizarre and sick and twisted, was sacrificing children passing through the fire unto their fake gods as, as this great sacrifice unto these gods, as if that would be a good thing. But Josiah, we see here, he started his reign as king when he was eight years old. That's what it says in verse number one of chapter 22 where we started. He started at eight years old. But what's really amazing about Josiah and, and I find this to just be absolutely incredible and just one more proof that the book that we read is literally the Word of God. This is not a scam. This is not just some prophecies. You know, you read about like, you know, Nostradamus, right? These people who supposedly are able to predict the future. And they have these really ambiguous and vague predictions of what's to come, right? So, when some event happens thousands of years later, people all say, look, he predicted this. And it's just, you can apply that to anything. You just wait for some event somewhere along the line to happen. And you say, oh, yeah, see, he predicted this. Those predictions are a joke. Keep your finger here in 2 Kings chapter 22. Flip backwards to 1 Kings chapter 13. Because Josiah is, is actually prophesied. And I want you to see this in 1 Kings chapter 13. Now, I was kind of giving you a little bit of a, of a summary to understand where we are in the history of the kingdom of Judah and the kingdom of Israel. And what we're going to see here 
in 1 Kings chapter 13 is this story about a man of God who preached against Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. So just real briefly, you had King David came after King. King Saul was the first king of Israel. Then King David came after him. And after David, he, he, appoint, he anointed his son Solomon to be the king. Right? Solomon reigned. He built the temple. It was, it was a golden age. It was a, it was a heyday for the kingdom of Israel. They were at their high point during King Solomon's reign. They were at peace. They were extremely wealthy. Everything was going great in King Solomon's days. But at the end of King Solomon's life, his heart was turned away from serving God. He had multiple wives. Remember, he had, he had you know, 700 wives and 300 concubines. And they turned his, his heart away from serving God. So he ended up building all these altars unto false gods. And because of that, God brought his judgment upon them. So when the kingdom passed from Solomon unto his son Rehoboam, God decided to take the kingdom away from the house of David, but he left them one part. That's why they were still able to reign over Judah. But what happened is that God ordained that he was going to divide it up. So what happened at that point, you had Rehoboam, excuse me, was the king, but God had chosen Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, to be the king over all of the other tribes. Jeroboam started off Good, but not for very long at all. Very, very quickly, what happened with Jeroboam was that he got scared because there was one portion of the kingdom that was Judah where the temple was, where the people would have to go to worship. And what he was afraid of, he was afraid that as the people in Israel and his kingdom traveled down to Jerusalem, that... <coughs> Over time, they would start to think, you know what, we should, we should get back under the rule of the house of David and try to unite the kingdoms again, and that basically he would be put to death because he was reigning over his kingdom. And he was worried that they were, that they were somehow going to go back to the old king. He didn't have his faith in God and trust that he was being established as a king, and he had nothing to worry about. But the way that he did in his flesh, what he decided to do then was he set up these golden calves and said, these be your gods. And he basically caused all the people and the children of Israel to sin by committing idolatry. So Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, becomes this, this standard of doing wickedly. As you read throughout the book of, of First and Second Kings, these, there constantly are people compared to him. You know, when you have a king, like, he did wickedly, but he wasn't quite as bad as Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. And where we are in the story now, we're going to read this prophecy in 1 Kings 13, is Jeroboam had, had built this altar unto a false god. And this man of God came out to rebuke him. So here's where we're at in 1 Kings 13. I know it's kind of a, bit, a long backstory. But I, I really want you to get the, the context of where we're at and why this is so important because this is very, very early on in the history of the kingdom of Israel. This is, this is way back early on after only a few kings have reigned. Verse number 1 of 1 Kings 13. The Bible reads, And behold, there came a man of God out of Judah by the word of the Lord unto Bethel. And Jeroboam stood by the altar to burn incense. And he cried against the altar in the word of the Lord and said, O altar, altar, thus saith the Lord, Behold, a child shall be born unto the house of David, Josiah by name, and upon thee shall he offer the priests of the high places that burn incense upon thee, and men's bones shall be burnt upon thee. And he gave a sign in the same, the same day, saying, This is the sign which the Lord hath spoken. Behold, the altar shall be rent, and the ashes that are upon it shall be poured out. And it came to pass when King Jeroboam heard the saying of the man of God, which had cried against the altar in Bethel, that he put forth his hand from the altar, saying, Lay hold on him. And his hand which he put forth against him dried up, so that he could not pull it in again to him. The altar also was rent, and the ashes poured out from the altar according to the sign which the man of God had given by the word of the Lord. 
Now notice what happens here. You've got Jeroboam getting ready to, to offer sacrifices up on his altar to a false god. This man of God comes in, and he's never named. We never even find out the name of this man of God. The Bible says this man of God comes. He rebukes in the, in the name of the, in the word of the Lord. God had given him this message to preach against Jeroboam. And he tells them this. He says, Behold, a child shall be born unto the house of David, Josiah by name. He names this king that is going to be born hundreds of years in the future. If you go back and you find the, you know, at the point where this happens in 1 Kings chapter 13, and then you start counting up the years with all the kings that reign all the way up until Josiah, it's approximately, it's not exact, approximately 340 years later. This prophetic statement by this man of God to Jeroboam named a man called Josiah that was going to come and offer the priests of the high places their bones to be burnt on that altar. He says, this is what's going to happen. All you priests that are worshiping these false gods, the bones of those priests are going to be offered up and, and burnt on that altar. And what's so amazing about this, I mean, think about 340 years is a long time. I mean, we're going back, if we were to do that today, that's going back to the 1600s. Imagine somebody in the 1600s stating that there's going to be this man and he's going to be born and he's going to be of the house of David, right? Of this genealogy, of this tree. And his name is going to be Josiah. And this is what he's going to do. 340 years later. And then we see that come to pass today. That is exactly what happened here. And this is recorded, I mean, this is well recorded in the scripture before Josiah ever even came. So Josiah being born, and here's what's cool about this, what's neat is that I honestly don't think that very many people considered that there is a king named Josiah born of the house of David 340 years later. And I'll tell you why in a minute when we get to that. Well, I'll just tell you why right now. Because as we read that story in, our, in the beginning chapter, we go back to 2 Kings chapter 2, we kind of read through most of the story of the life of Josiah. What happened with Josiah is that, you know, he was trying to serve the Lord. He wanted to do what was right in the, side, in the sight of God, but the problem was the people were just really ignorant. They were ignorantly worshiping the Lord. They knew some things, but they weren't going to the Scripture. And the reason why I know that is because when he, he offered to, uh, to build up the house of the Lord, Josiah's like, hey, let's, let's build this place up. Let's get this, let's repair all the cracks and all the problems. Let's get this place looking good again. In the process of doing that, when, when the workers were out, you know, the high priest came and he says, hey, look, we found a book. We found this book. And you know what the book was? It was a book of the prophecy of the law of Moses. It was the Bible for that time, right? The Bible that had been revealed up to that time. They had, they had the, law, the book of the Law of Moses, which had just been discovered in the church, in the temple. <coughs> which, to me, that always amazes me when I read that because it's like, what were these guys doing? What were they teaching? What were they going off of if they weren't, if they didn't even know where the scripture was and it's just like hidden away somewhere and it's not until they actually start doing repairs, they're like, oh, hey, look, what's this thing? <laughs> Dust it off. Hey, look at that. This is, this, is, this is the law of Moses. And then they start to read it and they realize how much sin they've gotten into. I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. But we see here the great prophecy of Josiah, and we see the, what, what they said was going to happen. We see that fulfilled in, in this chapter. So Josiah has been prophesied to come and do this and do these great things way before he was ever even born. One of the reasons why I think he, he turned out to be a great man, God knew this. God knew in advance. That's why he gave the prophecy. But um, as I mentioned earlier, you know, Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign. And it says here that he reigned 31 years in Jerusalem. Now, in 2 Chronicles 34, you don't have to turn there if you don't want to, but 
One more tidbit of information as we study the Bible and as you read the Bible. First and Second Chronicles, you'll find parallel with First and Second Kings. So you're going to find that um, a lot of the same stories will take place. And a good way to really understand a story is to look it up in both places because you end up getting some different information in one versus the other. Just like there's four Gospels, you have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in the New Testament. They cover basically the same events. But when you read, say, the book of Matthew versus the book of Luke, and you look at those same events that happen, you'll end up finding different information contained in both. So when you put it together, you really get the whole picture. So what I'm going to be reading for you from 2 Chronicles chapter 34 is basically this same, a similar account of the life of Josiah. But we get a little bit of extra information. See, in 2 Kings 22, that where we just read, it jumps from Josiah being eight years old when he began to reign to doing something 18 years later into his reign when he was 26 years old. But there were a few things that he had done in between this time that we find in 2 Chronicles chapter 34. So in 2 Chronicles 34 verse 3, the Bible says, For in the eighth year of his reign, while he was yet young, so he's 16 years old, he started at the age of eight, eight years into it, he's 16 years old, the Bible said he's, he's yet young, he began to seek after the God of David his father. This is the time where he starts to think, you know what, I want to serve God, I want to know more about the Lord. It says, and in the twelfth year, he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem from the high places and the groves and the carved images and the molten images. And they break down the altars of Balaam in his presence and the images that were on high above them he cut down. And the groves and the carved images and the molten images he break in pieces and made dust of them and strode it upon the graves of them that had sacrificed unto them. And he burnt the bones of the priests upon their altars and cleansed Judah and Jerusalem. So this is still early on in his life. He decides, you know, he seeks after the Lord. A few years later, he says, you know what? We got to get rid of all these false gods because the Lord is the true God. The Lord is who we should be serving, just as David, you know, his, his ancestor had. And he says, we're going to get rid of this stuff. And he's the king, so he has authority to do that. He said, we're getting all, rid of all these, you know, worshiping in the high places and all these altars, all these false gods. He says, we're going to stamp it to powder. We're going to get rid of it and destroy it. And praise the Lord that Josiah did that. He had a good heart to serve God. And then 18 years into his reign, at the age of 26, that's when he decides to repair the house of the Lord. His heart is in the right place, and he's already done some good things based off of what he knew. He knew that those other gods were false. He knew that there's one true God. So it's not like all knowledge was just completely gone about God. I think there's enough, God, enough knowledge for salvation, enough of the word of the Lord still around for people to, to, to believe on the Lord. But he still didn't really know much about God. Now, we could make this application for ourselves. Until you really get in the Bible for yourself, you don't really know that much. Now, people can get saved without reading the whole, the whole Bible for themselves. You can hear the Word of the Lord. It doesn't take much. Now, you do need the Word of God to be, to be saved. The Bible says, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. That's where our faith comes from. We're trusting in God's Word. We're trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. And the only way we can know about Him, it has to come from God's Word. So we are receiving the Word that's sown in our hearts and that seed gives life. God's Word gives life. Jesus Christ is the Word. That's what we're receiving when we get saved. <coughs> but you don't, you know, once you're born, you're a baby in Christ. When you're born again, you don't necessarily know very, I mean, I know when I was born again, I didn't know very much. I didn't know that much about the Bible. I didn't know much about God. I knew I was saved. You know, my faith was in Christ to save me. And just like this, I believe with Josiah, hey, I believe he was saved. I believe, you know, there were some things he knew. It's pretty obvious to tell that, hey, if this is the true God, these gods are false. Let's get rid of those, right? So there's some wisdom out there. But what we see here is that there wasn't much. 
And the reason why, if you look at verse number 8 of uh, 2 Kings 22, what happens here, it says, And Hilkiah the high priest said unto Shaphan the scribe, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan and he read it. So, I mean, this is the, this is the high priest says unto this scribe, Hey, guess what? I found the, house, the, the book of the law in the house of the Lord. I found it. Now, you would think of all people, the high priest should have been reading this the whole time, right? I mean, how could you be the high priest and be teaching and, oh, wait, by the way, oh, look, here's the law of the Lord. There it is. That's where I put that thing. He gave it to Shaphan and Shaphan reads it. So basically, um, you know, they tell the king about it and they start reading it to him. Now, the king loved God. You know, he had already done some things. He was getting rid of the false gods. And when he hears it, it says in verse 11, jump down to verse 11, it says, And it came to pass when the king had heard the words of the book of the law that he rent his clothes. Rent just means he ripped them. He broke them. He tore his clothing. And you'll find all throughout the Bible, you see people rending their clothes. It's something that you do when you have great emotion and you're grieving or real sad or you know, something really upsets you. They, they, they rend their clothing. right? It's just something that they did. Now, this is the right reaction. He has the right reaction because he gets really upset upon hearing the word of the Lord. It shows someone that actually cares about what God's word says. And I mentioned this earlier this morning um, in my sermon. is something very similar. You know, we all need to think about how do you react when you hear the word of God, when you hear the word of the Lord. If there's something that you hear that you've been doing wrong, does it, does it matter to you? Do you try to make excuses for yourself? Do you do, oh yeah, well, that's not really what that means and just try to come up with some excuse or try to find someone who'll be able to tell you some reason why it means something other than what it says? Because that's not the right attitude to have. If you're honest, if you, if you honestly just want to know God and His Word and just believe it and accept it like Josiah did, you'll probably get upset. I know when I learned things I did, hey, it's upsetting. It's troublesome. Now what he learned, he learned a lot from God's Word that he didn't know before. He kind of thought things were still pretty good. Yeah, he's getting some things right. I'm going to get rid of these bad things. But he had no idea to the extent to which things had gotten so far away from observing and following the word of the Lord until he actually heard it for himself. And honestly, just about every new Christian, just about any, any Christian, when you first get saved, you don't quite realize how far gone the world really is and how sinful things really are until you start reading for yourself. And you start seeing all of the things. Because look, let's be honest, even if you came to church every single service, we're only going through, ultimately, a, a very small portion of this book. Now, over years and years and years, sure, we'll get through the whole thing. But I mean, that's going to take a long time. It takes a lot less time for you. Well, a lot less time, not a lot less time, but you have a lot more time at home to be reading all of this stuff for yourself and, and seeing the, getting the full picture and seeing all of these things that maybe you didn't know before. But how is your reaction going to be? Do you care what God's Word says? And you know, what I want for this church, I want to fill this church with people who do care what God's Word says. That we honestly care and believe it to be true and not going to make excuses for it or try to, try to make it sound a little bit better or a little bit easier to swallow. Look, God's Word says what it says and I love it. And God's Word is going to help you, but we need to have the proper reaction. We ought to care what it says. Jump down to verse number 13 here in 2 Kings 22. After Josiah hears this, he says, Go ye, and he sends a bunch of people, inquire of the Lord for me. And this is something that they used to do back then because there was a little bit more communication between the prophets and God himself. And they would go and inquire to God because God's word hadn't completely been revealed in this time as it is today. We have 
the entire word of God. Now all of his words have been revealed. But they would go and inquire of the Lord. They would ask God for direction and things that they would need to do. You remember King David would even ask God, hey, should I go and fight this battle? Is this something that you want me to do? God, is this the right thing? And he would inquire of the Lord. And God would tell him either yes or no, if that's what he wanted them to do. And when every time they would obey the will of the God, God always pulled them through and God always blessed them and made sure that they would, um, that they would succeed. But when they disregarded the word of the Lord, that's when they would fail and fail miserably. <coughs> so he goes and sends people to go and inquire of the Lord for me. He says, and for the people and for all Judah concerning the words of this book that is found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is kindled against us because our fathers have not hearkened unto the words of this book to do according unto all that which is written concerning us. He hears what's in the law of Moses and he's like, wow. Now mind you, this is just the way he's brought up, right? As a child, he doesn't know any better. He hasn't heard the Bible. He hasn't heard all of God's Word. He's heard some things. He's heard some things about the Lord. He's heard, he's heard some things. He's learned some stuff, but he hasn't actually gotten the whole message from God. And when he finally does, he realizes, whoa, we, we are in some serious trouble. Because he believed God, he believed God's word to be true. And he's like, wait a minute, if this is true, if this, if this book, if what this book says is true, God's wrath is going to come down on us big time. He's like, our fathers haven't been following this at all. And this is what people need to realize. And you know, honestly, you can even apply this to salvation. Most people grow up, if, especially if you don't, don't grow up too much around the Bible, it's not that big of a deal. You know, you sin, you do things wrong. Yeah, you kind of know you've done wrong. You know, people, you kind of get it. We have a conscience. We know we've done wrong. But the vast majority of people don't think, oh, well, I'm going to hell for that. They don't think that, you know, they say, oh, God, you know, God understands. He knows my heart. He knows that I've been struggling. And yeah, I've done some things that are bad. But ultimately, I'm not that bad of a person. So he's going to let me in. This is the most common attitude that people have. And what they need to do is to hear the word of the Lord that they're not okay. If Christ isn't your Savior, you are not okay. Because those sins that you've committed that you might not think have been so bad will send you to hell. And God does have wrath. That's the, you know, the, the flames of hell are kindled by God's wrath. And God is angry with the wicked every day. You say, well, I'm not wicked. Yeah, but you're a sinner. You don't even realize it. People need to hear the word of the Lord, but not just hear it, be able to receive it and say, oh, wow, I'm in trouble. What do I need to do? And then they hear the answer, the good news. Well, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And be able to receive that and just believe it, as Josiah did. But see, when he heard this, He knew that there was a problem. He knew that, there, that, that something needed to be done. Now, these days, people will mock and ridicule you when you try to tell them about the wrath of God. Oftentimes, people say, oh, yeah, God's, God's not, uh, he's not that mean. There's no wrath. I, we talked to someone last week, Sebastian and I, um, I forget what the name of the religion was, but it was, it was basically a Buddhist religion. And... Um, you know, this lady was trying to say, oh, yeah, well, you know, we all kind of believe different things. We're all going to go to the same place. And she believed in all this reincarnation, all kinds of weird stuff. And we were trying to tell her. She, she knew enough about, about uh, Christianity. She knew, you know, trying to preach her the gospel, trying to get her to understand um, the difference. Because I think she had been brought up like Seventh-day Adventist or something. And I, and I was trying to explain how, you know, there's still differences in what we believe, even from them and what you've been taught. Because we believe you can't lose your salvation. It's saved forever. And, um, you know, all this other stuff. We had this long conversation with her, trying to convince her. But one of the things that she said was that, well, no, I mean, God is, God is love, right? And that, and that she had this perception of a one-sided God, that God is a positive only God. But that's not true. Now, a lot of people might believe that. 
And a lot of people who only hear bits and pieces out of the Bible, you can hear the verses that do say, yes, God is love. Absolutely, that's found in the Bible because God is love. God is long-suffering. He is merciful. He is very loving. All of those things exist in the Bible, but if you don't read the Bible cover to cover and that's all you know, you're not going to realize, you know what, there's also another side to God. He's not just, you know, rainbows and unicorns. <laughs> it's not just all positive. God, God gets angry. God has wrath. There's, there's heaven, yes, and it's beautiful and it's wonderful. And it's a place where we're not going to get old and we're not going to get sick and that our, our bodies are going to be not giving us any pain and it's going to be an excellent place and there's going to be joy and happiness and there's no sin. And, it's, and, and as, as beautiful as a place that is, he also created a place called hell, which is the exact opposite, which is the worst place that you could ever think to be. It's a place that is... That is a, a terrible place of torture and torment and burning. And God's wrath kindles the flames of that place. He has wrath. He has love. He has both. And we need to understand the great wrath that is upon us when we just disregard the word of the Lord, which is what had happened here, which is what Josiah had found out and that he was going to find out now. He would go and inquire and say, God, what's going to happen now? Because I see with your words, this is all going bad. This is not good. Let's, let's see here in verse number 16. The Bible says, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will bring evil upon this place and upon the inhabitants thereof. Even all the words of the book which the king of Judah hath read. So this is the response from God when he went and, went and sent to inquire of the Lord. He says, I will bring evil upon this place. Yeah, I am going to do it. Yeah, I am standing by my words that I had written. Everything that the words of the book said, they're going to happen. He says in verse 17, because they have forsaken me and have burned incense unto other gods that they might provoke me to anger. Again, there's the anger of the Lord with all the works of their hands. Therefore, my wrath shall be kindled against this place and shall not be quenched. He's like, yep, destruction's coming. I'm angry. They've gone and served other gods. And now I'm going to come and, um, and bring my judgment upon them. Verse number 18. But to the king of Judah, which sent you to inquire of the Lord, thus shall ye say to him, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, as touching the words which thou hast heard. Because thine heart was tender, and thou hast humbled thyself before the Lord, when thou heardest what I spake against this place, and against the inhabitants thereof, that they should become a desolation and a curse, and hast rent thy clothes and wept before me. I also have heard thee, saith the Lord. Behold, therefore, I will gather thee unto thy fathers, and thou shalt be gathered into thy grave in peace, and thine eyes shall not see all the evil which I will bring upon this place. And they brought the king word again. So what we see here, and this is, should be an encouragement for us, because, and I brought this up again this morning in this morning's sermon, but we're living in a world today that is going to face the judgment of God. There are just too many things that have been done in this world, in this country to date, with the promotion of all the wickedness and the sodomy, and, you know, and the, and, the, and the abortions, the babies being killed, and just the, the adultery and rampant sin that's, that's going on and is just being tolerated, and not even just tolerated, but accepted by our culture. We live in a sinful world, in a sinful culture that's just accepting of everything. And mark my words, the next thing to be tolerated after the homosexuality is pedophilia. Watch, it's going to happen. They've already introduced the alternative lifestyles and try to say, oh yeah, these people, they're, they're just a little bit different. They just have these tendencies for someone of the same gender. Watch, because they've already been doing this and they've already been trying to get this idea in your heads that, oh, these people, they just, they just have this desire for liking people who are a little bit younger. And instead of what they used to call them, perverts and pedophiles, now it's just going to be another alternative lifestyle. There's nothing new under the sun. It's not like this hasn't happened in the past. Look at ancient Rome. They did this kind of weird stuff. And look what happened to them. 
They get real decadent. They get real proud in their sin and just in their shame. They have no shame whatsoever. And they start doing these weird, abominable acts. And before you know it, God's going to bring his destruction. He's going to bring his judgment on that place. And you know what? I believe the United States of America is going to receive the judgment of God based on the Bible and just all the biblical history that we have. It has to happen. God is going to judge this nation for its wickedness. But there is hope for us. There is hope that we can be like a Josiah and we could say, hey, I didn't know all this stuff was so bad, God, but now I see it. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to humble myself and I'm going to get on my knees and I'm going to pray to you, Lord, and just beg you and ask you, please have mercy on me. And not only that, I'm going to go out and try to be a light to shine in this dark world. And because of the humility of King Josiah, that he didn't just make up an excuse when he heard about, you know, all these were, oh, well, these old words, what do they mean anyways? And that was written so long ago, you could say, oh yeah, with Moses, pff, that was a long time ago. Look, people have been doing all this sin, where's the judgment of God? And that's what people say these days. Well, you know, it's been 2,000 years since Jesus was around. When's he coming back? He said he's coming back. I don't see it. I don't see any judgment coming. I continue to sin and get away with it. This is the attitude that some people might have. That's not the attitude that King Josiah had. King Josiah didn't try to make up an excuse and say, oh, well, yeah, but the, the reason why we did this is because we're just trying to worship God in a different way by making up these statues. We're really worshiping the Lord, but it's just a little bit different way of doing it. It's just our style of doing it. He didn't do any of that stuff. He didn't make up an excuse. He didn't try to justify the sin, the sins of his fathers. He said, look, they sin." And it's wrong, and it's very clear according to his word. And he humbled himself. And because of that, God had mercy on his life. And he said, okay, you know what? During your reign, I'm not going to bring the wrath. It's going to come. But he postponed it. He prolonged it. And, you know, I am just pray that we could get enough of a remnant together to serve God and to say, God, we know that the destruction's coming, but give us just a little bit more time to go out and do this great work for you so that we, we are spared from the destruction that's to come. That's what he did for Josiah. Now flip over, if you would, real quick to chapter 23. We're in chapter 22. Because the story continues about King Josiah here in chapter 23. <coughs> in chapter 23, King, was, um, King Josiah makes a covenant with God that him and all the people are going to follow the Lord. And then he has this great house cleaning. And I, and I love this. This is the, I wish, you know, if every Christian had this type of an attitude when they hear the word of the Lord, oh man, there would be such a great revival and, and such a culture shift if people can just get in the Bible. First of all, just hear what it says. Dust off that word of the Lord from off of your, off of your bookshelf and open it up and read it. And then after you read it, go through and, and identify all the problem areas and get rid of them. Let's start reading what King Josiah did here in verse number 4 of, of chapter 23. Verse number 4 reads, And the king commanded Hilkiah the high priest and the priests of the second order and the keepers of the door to bring forth out of the temple of the Lord all the vessels that were made for Baal and for the grove and for all the hosts of heaven. And he burned them without Jerusalem in the, in the fields of Kidron and carried the ashes of them unto Bethel. And he put down the idolatrous priests whom the kings of Judah had ordained to burn incense in the high places in the cities of Judah and in the places round about Jerusalem. Them also that burned incense unto Baal, to the sun and to the moon and to the planets and to all the hosts of heaven. Now, as we read this, we're going to read a lot more of what he did. Just look at how bold his actions were. I mean, he's putting these people to death. What says he put them down? He put them to death. He says, look, all of you people are worshiping these false gods. You are bringing God's curse upon us. And these things weren't allowed in the Mosaic law. People were not allowed to just worship all these false gods. God says no, because that's going to spread like a cancer. 
this false god worship, and it did. And it turned the hearts of the people away from serving God. And Josiah said, no, we're getting right. We're going to get rid of all this wicked Satan worship. Because that's what it is. I'll tell you this. False religion, like Islam, like Buddhism, like any false religion out there in the world, is our satanic religions. You say, oh, no, but they teach good things. No, they're satanic religions. They're not of God. They follow a different source. They follow a different scripture. They follow a different God. They do not follow the God of the Bible. If you're, if you're following something other than the God of the Bible, you're following a false God. You're following an idol, something else, and that is of Satan. Satan is trying to get people away from serving the Lord. They are satanic religions no matter what type of clothing they put on, whether they try to make you think that they're pretty good, that they're not that bad. It really is that bad. So here's what King Josiah did. He said, he, he said you know, all these people are burning incense on the Baal. We're getting rid of all of them. Verse number six, and he brought out the grove from the house of the Lord without Jerusalem unto the brook Kidron and burned it at the brook Kidron and stamped it small to powder and cast the powder thereof upon the graves of the children of the people. And he brake down the houses of the Sodomites that were by the house of the Lord where the women wove hangings for the grove. So we see here, he's getting rid of the Sodomites now too. He's saying, look, we're getting rid of this filthiness. We're getting rid of this wickedness. Let's get it all out of here. And look at where they were. It says that they were by the house of the Lord. The Sodomites were right up next to the house of the Lord. They felt that comfortable being right up there. Now look, it doesn't sound to me like the right preaching was coming out of the house of the Lord if the Sodomites felt comfortable living right next to the house of the Lord. They ought not to feel comfortable in the presence of hearing God's word when God's word speaks so harshly against sodomy. Verse number eight. And he brought all the priests out of the cities of Judah and defiled the high places where the priests had burned incense from Geba to Beersheba and break down the high places of the gates that were in the entering in of the gate of Joshua, the governor of the city, which were on a man's left hand at the gate of the city. Nevertheless, the priests of the high places came not up to the altar of the Lord in Jerusalem, but they did eat of the unleavened bread among their brethren. Verse number 10, And he defiled Topheth, which is in the valley of the children of Hinnom, that no man might make his son or his daughter to pass through the fire to Molech. Molech was a false god. This was all about the child sacrifice that they were doing. He caused the child sacrifices to stop. Praise God for that. Verse number 11. And he took away the horses that the kings of Judah had given to the sun. So they're worshiping the sun. They're worshiping all these gods, all these false idols. They're worshiping even the sun at the entering into the house of the Lord. So they bring these horses at the entrance of the house of the Lord that are dedicated to the sun. It says, by the chamber of Nathan Melech, the chamberlain, which was in the suburbs, and burned the chariots of the sun with fire. They had the idols brought basically into the house of God. And the altars that were on the top of the upper chamber of Ahaz, which the kings of Judah had made, and the altars which Manasseh had made in the two courts of the house of the Lord, did the king beat down and break them down from thence and cast the dust of them into the brook Kidron. In the high places that were before Jerusalem, which were on the right hand of the Mount of Corruption, which Solomon the king of Israel had builded for Ashtoreth, the abomination of the Zidonians, and for Chemesh, the abomination of the Moabites, and for Milcom, the abomination of the children of Ammon, did the king defile. And look at how amazing is that. King Solomon, which again was um, over 300 years in the past, some of the altars that he had established were still in place unto that day. Now, as you read the, the book of First and Second Kings, You'll find that there were kings that were good, that obeyed the, the, you know, God, and that were doing the right thing. But over and over again, even when all these kings are doing good things for God, you'll find that they didn't really get rid of all, the, all of these, the high places, getting rid of all of these false gods and these false items. And that was just um, a snare unto them throughout their whole existence. 
But finally, King Josiah says, we are getting rid of this stuff. This is wicked. We don't, we're not, we're not, you know, worshiping these abominations. And it can be hard to do sometimes for people, I think, when you have things that have been established that have been there long before you. you say, oh yeah, well, that's, that's just always been there. And you're kind of used to it. When you grow up with things, you see things, it's just, it's just part of the way it is. Josiah had a different way of thinking, though. He had a great way of thinking. He didn't just look at it and say, well, that's been there since Solomon. I mean, Solomon built that. That's just always been there. Oh, yeah, yeah, that altar, yeah, that's been there. He says, no, it's wickedness. We're getting rid of it. And what we need to do is take a fresh look at our lives and the things within our house and the things that we do and try to look at it in light of the Bible and in light of God's Word. That's what King Josiah did. He didn't care how long it's been there and what type of tradition it had and how long it was there erected. He said, this is wickedness and this has to go. We're getting rid of it. I don't care if you have <coughs> some trinket at your house that's actually like an idol. Let's say you have a molten figure that the Bible says not to make of like an animal or a beast or something. And you can say, well, this has been passed down in my family for like over 100 years. If it's an idol, are you going to just justify that and say... Well, it's, it's part of our tradition. It's part of my family history. Or are you going to get rid of it? If you look at everything just in the simple light of the law of the Lord, you say, you know what? I'm going to get rid of it. Because it's not right. They shouldn't have had it. I'm not going to make an excuse for them. I'm going to do what's right. King Josiah did what's right. He got rid of the stuff that he knew was displeasing unto God. It says in verse... Uh, 14, and he brake in pieces the images and cut down the groves and filled their places with the bones of men. Moreover, the altar that was at Bethel and the high place which Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin, had made both that altar and the high place. He brake down and burned the high place and stamped it small to powder and burned the grove. This is all house cleaning. He's getting rid of the trash. Josiah is getting rid of all the wickedness. And once he does all of that, now they're ready to actually serve the Lord. He's like, first things first, we got to get rid of all this garbage. We got to get rid of all the stuff that's hindering us, that's making God angry. And this is a good um, method or procedure in your own life. Let's start off getting rid of all the, the, the big blaring sins in our life so that then we can actually turn to doing good things. We can't start serving God really effectively until we can get rid of a lot of the, the, the major sin that's holding us back, and then we can look forward to serving God. And you look down in verse number 21, now we're going to see some of the good things that he did in keeping the Passover unto the Lord. It says in verse 21, And the king commanded all the people, saying, Keep the Passover unto the Lord your God, as it is written in the book of this covenant. See, he hadn't really known about this before because he didn't even read the Bible. He didn't know it from God's word. Now he sees it. Now he sees, hey, this is something we need to be doing. Verse 22, Surely there was not holding such a Passover from the days of the judges that judged Israel, nor in all the days of the kings of Israel, nor of the kings of Judah. But in the 18th year of King Josiah, <coughs> wherein this Passover was holding to the Lord in Jerusalem. Moreover, the workers with familiar spirits and the wizards and the images and the idols and all the abominations that were spied in the land of Judah and in Jerusalem did Josiah put away that he might perform the words of the law which were written in the book that Hilkiah the priest found in the house of the Lord. And like unto him was there no king before him that turned to the Lord with all his heart and with all his soul and with all his might, according to all the law of Moses, neither after him arose there any like him. This is one of the reasons why Josiah is one of my favorite characters in the Bible. He started off, you know, trying to serve God in, in his own wisdom and in his own knowledge. But when he actually heard the Bible, he received it. He received it wholeheartedly. <coughs> He did his best to make sure that he was following everything that God had said. He held this great Passover, and we didn't read all the scriptures. I'm not going to read it for sake of time tonight. But this huge feast for the Passover. 
And they really, you know, they killed the lamb, but they like, like he had this big feast for the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which lasted um, after the, the actual Passover where they would slay the lamb. And um, it was a big event. He says that like it was the biggest event in the entire history of the nation of Israel, the one that he held. Because he had zeal for God and he was serving him to the utmost. This is someone that we could look to and say, you know what? I want to have that type of zeal in serving God. I'm going to read his book and I'm going to see what it says. And I'm going to apply this to my life. And I'm going to look and analyze what are all the things that might be making God mad that I'm doing, that I have in my house, that I talk about, that I watch, whatever it is. I'm going to get rid of these things. And honestly, you know, people have these, this, this thing where it's like you feel like you can't get rid of certain things. I don't understand why. It's really not that big of a deal no matter what it is. No matter what it is that's wicked, you know, get rid of it. So this was the life of King Josiah that we have recorded in the Bible. Great man of God. And he was a king. Would to God we would have a ruler like a Josiah that, was, that would turn to God with all of their heart. Wouldn't that be great? Now his death was unfortunate. And uh, you could turn real quick. It's the last place we're going to turn. I'm going to close with this in 2 Chronicles chapter 35. It's just after 2 Kings. You have 1 Chronicles and 2 Chronicles. 2 Chronicles chapter 35. We're going to read about the death of Josiah. He was a great man of God, and we see that he turned to God. He served him with all of his heart, with all of his mind, with all of his strength, and he served the Lord. And did all these great, made all these great changes to try to, to try to get the people right with God. And you know what else is great about that? Is that he knew that destruction was going to come from the Lord. He knew that God's judgment was going to come. Yet he still, he didn't, he didn't give up, throw up his hands and say, well, whatever, I can't do anything anyways, and just give up. He still chose to serve the Lord. He still did everything in his power to help and to do what he was supposed to be doing. And this is what we ought to have to do. Even if we know, hey, God's going to, judgment's going to come, then we're not just going to sit on our hands and just do nothing about it. We know it's going to come, but we need to, to do our best to do what's right in the eyes of the Lord. Now, Josiah was a great man of God. You could tell he was a fighter by the bold, the bold actions he took and, and getting rid of all those false prophets and burning them down and just, just, just getting rid of everything. He had that fight in him, but he ended up dying getting into a fight that was none of his business. And we're going to see that here in 2 Chronicles chapter 35. Look at verse number 20. 2 Chronicles 35 verse number 20. The Bible reads, After all this, when Josiah had prepared the temple... Necho, king of Egypt, came up to fight against Carchemish by Euphrates, and Josiah went out against him. So they didn't come against Judah. This king of Egypt came out, Pharaoh Necho, to fight against Carchemish, which is just another country, and Josiah came out to fight against him. It says in verse 21, But he sent ambassadors to him, saying, What have I to do with thee, thou king of Judah? I come not against thee this day, but against the house wherewith I have war. For God commanded me to make haste. Forbear thee from meddling with God who is with me, that he destroy thee not. And he's warning him here. Say, look, I don't have a fight with you. I don't know why you're coming out against me. I'm at war with this other country. You know, God's with me. And he's telling him here, look, God, God is with me. He's told me to go out and, and, and to um, you know, fight this battle. So if you fight against me, Josiah, you're going to be fighting against God. And, and I don't recommend that you do that. Verse 22, Nevertheless, Josiah would not turn his face from him, but disguised himself. See, he wanted to get in this fight so bad, he decided not to do it publicly, but he really wanted to do it. So he disguised himself that he might fight with him and hearkened not unto the words of Necho from the mouth of God. Now that's interesting. Because the Bible's telling us right here that what Pharaoh Necho was saying was actually true. That he was fighting for the Lord and that God was using Necho to warn Josiah not to fight. So ultimately, Josiah didn't listen to Pharaoh Necho, but he didn't listen to God either because God was using Pharaoh to give him that warning. And um, 
and that's what we see clearly right here, that not unto the words of Nico, from the mouth of God, and came to fight in the valley of Megiddo. And the archer shot at King Josiah, and the king said to his servants, Have me away, for I am sore wounded. His servants therefore took him out of, the chair, out of that chariot and put him in the second chariot that he had. And they brought him to Jerusalem, and he died and was buried in one of the sepulchres of his fathers. And all Judah and Jerusalem mourned for Josiah. And Jeremiah lamented for Josiah, and all the singing men and the singing women spake of Josiah and their lamentations to this day, and made them an ordinance in Israel, and behold, they are written in the lamentations. A lot of respect there from the people. I mean, even the prophet Jeremiah, because Jeremiah was prophesying during the days of Josiah, and, and he was doing great things. And, uh, and Jeremiah saw, too, that this was a... This was someone who respected God and was trying to do what was right in the eyes of the Lord. And it is sad when he, he dies like that. And if he would have just kept his, his nose out of other people's fights. You know, we've got a lot, of, a lot to, to deal with just doing what's right and, and doing what's right by God and just dealing with the fights that we have to deal with, the fight of our faith, to go get involved in some other fights. God doesn't want us wasting our time with other people's fights, especially a physical battle like that. They had nothing to do with him. And even our country, you know, we get involved in all these other fights around the world that we ought not to be, to be getting involved with. And what's going to happen is it's going to come back on us. And it already has. And there's been, that's why the United States is so hated all around the world in general, not everywhere, but in so many places because we go in and we stick our nose in places where it doesn't belong. We don't have to be getting involved in everybody's fight. We don't have to police the whole world. Let's get ourselves right with what, what, what God has given us. Let's, get, let's focus back as a, as a country, back on the internal, on the heart of our country. And let's get our heart right back with the Lord. And see if nothing else, we can stay that judgment and push it off a little bit. Josiah, great man of God, great king here. Uh, Someone that we can look to as an inspiration, as someone who got his heart right with God and just accepted everything that he saw and heard from the Lord and just, and just really changed so many things and, and, and to the best of his ability could do. We should all try to do that in our own lives personally as we read. Hey, read the Bible for yourself. Don't just trust what you've heard before and, and even just what you hear at church or what the pastor says. Read it for yourself. See what God really has to say. God, hey, if you're born again, you've got the Holy Spirit residing inside of you. He will teach you. He will, he will lead you into all wisdom. But he can't do that if you're not reading the Word and getting in the Bible for yourself. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your words and the great instruction that we have. Thank you for the story of King Josiah and um, all, the, all the great acts that he did, dear Lord, and how he served you with his whole heart. God, I pray that you would please help us to have that type of fervent spirit and that type of heart to serve you, dear Lord, and to just, just get rid of all the garbage that we have in our own lives that we might effectively serve you and just serve you wholeheartedly, dear Lord, and be excited about serving you and, and doing the things that you have laid out for us, dear Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.